um, that advertise the agenda of disciplines like women's studies, which claim outright precisely what I have been complaining, uh, what I have been claiming, and furthermore, also note that their purpose as educational establishments is to generate activists who will demolish that structure. And so that, as I said again, and I'll say, as I said before, I'll say again, that ethos already characterizes the humanities at, at large in the university, with very few exceptions. And the humanities are at the heart of the university. Now, you may think, well, why is that relevant to you? This is just an ivory tower affair. It's like, do not make that mistake. The world runs on ideas. And the ideas that are in the universities are the ideas that are going to be in the general public in five to 10 years. And there's no shielding yourself from them. So what's there is coming, and I can see it coming. It's been coming in Canada with quite substantial force. We had the worst scandal in, at a university in Canadian history in the last two months as a consequence of some new legislation that was passed in Canada, which I won't get into. But suffice it to say, it was an ugly situation. What's the solution to the fact that the web is a corrupt, heteronormative, tyrannical patriarchy? Well, the answer to that is to tear it down from the bottom up. And that's exactly what students are being taught at the more radical end of the universities. And that's coming to your schools very, very rapidly. And that's partly because of all the disciplines that have become corrupt at the universities, the faculties of education are probably first and foremost above them. Along them. Now, it's a tight race because there are other disciplines that are arguably equally corrupt. Uh, women's studies it should certainly be one of them. Um, so that's the current situation. Now, how is this, how is this retooling to be conducted, well, first in the form of conceptual assault. And you'll still see flurries of, uh, of this appearing in the popular press, indicative of the fight that's going on at a much lower level. There's an assault on the idea that the nuclear family is the appropriate, uh, what we call a container within which human beings should organize their lives and raise children. That's an idea that's under deep assault. There's a, uh, there's a deep assault on the idea of man and woman itself, and that's, that's played out at all in all of the controversy around transgender identity, um, most of which, by the way, has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with any care about the rights of transgender individuals. I, I know that quite well because many transgender people are registering in Canada, about 40 so far, um, complaining about the fact that the transgender activists, number one, do not speak for them, and number two, are, are basically offering them as the newest sacrificial victims on the radical left's radical political agenda. So there's an assault on the idea of man and woman, and that's coming into your schools unbelievably quickly. You can look up the gender unicorn if you're interested in that. Remember that, gender unicorn. I know God only knows what sort of world we live in where such a thing exists, but um, it's definitely something that will open your eyes. And there's an assault as well on the categories of logic, reason, competence, and excellence. Logic, because it's seen as only an extension of the patriarchal red web. Reason, because reason is the strategy that the patriarchal web uses to justify its own existence. Confidence, because confidence is the mask that successful people wear to pretend that they didn't steal their success as a consequence of power. And excellence, because excellence is a term that signifies success by which the thieves justify their success. And that's the basic philosophy. Now, here, here's a simple way of telling if you're being exposed to this sort of thing un, un, unknowingly, let's say, or more importantly, perhaps for you, that your children are being exposed to it. And that's that you'll hear discussions of these five topics, especially in an educational setting where they're built increasingly into their curricula. Diversity, which is predicated on the idea that the health and uh, moral appropriateness of a culture should be judged by its well, it's, it's careful attention to the details of group representation, which is an appalling idea. Um, inclusivity, which I haven't even been able to define properly, so I'm not going to discuss. And equity, which is uh, an unbelievably <coughs> toxic word. I mean, equity sounds nice. Everybody should have what they need, let's say. That's equity, but that's not equity. Equity is equality of outcomes. And we've played equality of outcome games many times in the last 150 years, and I would suggest that it hasn't gone very well. And so when you listen to people talk about equity, you're, talk, you're listening to people who are avowed enemies of the Western, of Western civilization. Make no mistake about it. And you can say the same thing about gender. And so one of the things that you might think about doing is 
waking up to this sort of thing so that when your children are exposed to this, which they most certainly will be, if not in public school, which, and it will happen there, without a doubt, without a doubt in university, especially if they're not in disciplines that are tightly associated with the science, the sciences, which are, by the way, also under assault. So, what's the alternative to this worldview? Well, one is the rise of the far right, and we're definitely seeing signs of that, especially in places like Europe. And the reason for that is that the people on the far right who are identitarians, who are playing po identity politics, just like the people on the far left, are basically saying something like this. All right, if we're gonna play the game of each of us is defined by our race or ethnicity, we're going to play the same game, but we're bloody well going to win. And I would suggest that that's also a pathway that we don't want to walk down since we did that already about 60 years ago and it turned out to be a very bad idea. So what I've been doing over the last 18 months or so is talking to students mostly, young people, young men often because they seem to be the ones that are most attracted to what I'm saying about an alternative route, which is a return to the fundamental, what, what would you say, the fundamental, the fundamental bedrock of Western society, which is the idea that the individual is the, is the canonical category and that the responsible individual is the proper aim. And so the idea that I've been trying to put forward is that the answer to the ills that our society still obviously suffers from, given that no society is perfect, although we do pretty well in comparison to the thuggish tyranny that rule most of the world, that the proper response of the typical individual, all of you included within that, is that people should adopt an ethos of responsibility rather than continually clamoring about the rights, which is something that we've talked about for about four decades too long, as far as I can tell. And so I've produced a very large series of videos online outlining the idea of personal responsibility, the idea that each of us has a manifest destiny, let's say, to confront the chaos and the tyranny of the world as individuals and to work wholeheartedly and nobly toward making the world a stronger and better place because the alternative is the absolute lunacy of the radical left, which is murderous right to the core and the equal, equally crazy counter response of the radical right. And so I was invited here today to tell you what I think is happening and what I think is coming, and I know that it's a very harsh message, but I do believe that it also happens to be one that's true. And it would be good if you woke up and watched what was happening and took appropriate action sooner rather than later, because taking action sooner is going to be a lot of trouble, but it's not going to be anywhere near as much trouble as it is going to be taking action later. I made a video about two weeks ago, a week ago, actually suggesting to junior high and high school students and their parents that if they are being taught by teachers who use this terminology, diversity, inclusivity, equity, white privilege, and gender, that they leave their classes because they left the realm of education and entered the realm of indoctrination. And there's no excuse whatsoever for that. So I guess I'm putting those ideas out before you. And I'm going to talk to Vance about them. And uh, that's my, what would you call it, my description of the state of the university and of the ideological warfare that's occurring at a very high level right at the basis of our society. So thank you very much. say that's probably the single most provocative um, speech I've heard at a Farm Bureau event, maybe in, uh... <laughs> uh, Yes, I know. I could have known <laughs> So, these people gathered here to exchange ideas about farming and uh, about best practices and about how they're going to organize their um, political systems in order, in order that their farms can survive and thrive into the future. What you were talking about um, sounds so hyperbolic as to be difficult to believe. So if people were to look around at the world, what are the things that they would look to to determine whether or not what you are saying is true or not true? Well, I suppose one of the things you would look at 
is something that recently happened in Canada. I mentioned that there was a scandal at a university called Wilfrid Laurier, and what happened was that a teaching assistant there named Lizzie Shepherd <coughs> showed a clip of a debate between myself and another professor at the University of Toronto um, about some legislation in Canada known as Bill C-16, which purported to add gender identity and gender expression to the list of protected groups under the Canadian Human Rights Code, but which was in reality an attempt to write in a particular view of human identity, uh, what we would call it acceptable to the radical left into the structure of Canadian law and to compel a certain kind of speech, which I objected to quite vociferously and which caused a major scandal in Canada as a consequence. Um, she was hauled before an inquisition. There's, not, there's no other way of really describing it, consisting of two faculty members and an administrator who accused her merely as a consequence of showing a five minute clip of this video, which had been shown on Canadian public television by a state, by what was essentially a state broadcaster, and a very middle of the road broadcaster at that, that she was accused of breaking provincial and federal law of being a far-right agitator, of being a transphobe and a bigot, and at the same time, I was compared to Hitler and Milo Yiannopoulos. I don't know if you know who Milo Yiannopoulos is, but it's pretty ridiculous to be compared to Hitler and Milo Yiannopoulos as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, that caused, she taped it because she was afraid of the fury, and she released the tape, and that caused an international scandal. And you can go listen to the tape. I would highly recommend it. Millions of people have listened to it, and they had every reason to. And the people, the radical leftists say, well, they said that the professors misconstrued the law, which they did not, and they said they overstepped their boundaries, which they may have, but they were following university policy. There was a university administrator at the hearing, and all of this occurred merely as a consequence of the unfolding of these sorts of ideas. So that's probably the best single piece of proof that's emerged so far. I warned a year and a half ago, about September 2017, that the law was written in such a way to make the sort of thing that happened with Wilfred Laurier not only possible, but inevitable, That's because laws have consequences. Ideas have consequences. They unfold in the world in a deterministic manner, in a quasi-deterministic manner. When you write things down on paper and put them into law, then things happen. That's how it works. And that's what happened with Wilfred Laurier. So the, the president of the university apologized to her and said that she had done nothing wrong and said that the university would revisit its stance on free speech. But I have very little optimism about that because the humanities departments from which these professors emerged, for example, and the administrative structure from which the punitive administrator emerged are built so deeply into the structure of the university that I don't think they can reverse it. I mean, these people are all tenured. They're going to be there for the next 25 years, and most of them are young. So what the hell is the university going to do about that? There's nothing as far as I can tell. I think the universities have become deeply corrupt, and I would say deeply and dangerously corrupt. <coughs> and the worst of it, the worst of that is, is that they're educating the people that are educating their children. They're educating, they're miseducating the people who will now be miseducating their children. But Dr. Peterson, so one of the markers of the United States is that we had land grant universities. In fact. <coughs> Much of the production, much of the sciences, everything from hybrids all the way out to genetic engineering was created at the university. Yep. And so when you bring forward these ideas as so much corruption, I, it, it's difficult to, for me to even, I mean, it feels like something I should brace for you. Um, right, definitely. So um, why believe it? That, uh, that's what I struggle with. Yeah, well, I mean, there are disciplines that are essentially untouched in the sorts of, more or less, the disciplines that you're describing, the ones that are grounded in the sciences, are still robust, I would say, and still performing their job, but they're, they're, they're in much more danger than they think. So the thing about scientists is that, and, and, and people generally who are working hard, is that they focus on a narrow specialty, and they devote their life to it, and that's a great thing, right, because that's how you make new discoveries. But that only works if the surrounding structure is actually supportive of such endeavors and not and not what leaking, listing, and, and, and threatening to sink. Well, the sciences are still in decent shape, and if you're gonna send your kids to university, I would say make sure that they take courses that are grounded in the sciences because there's some safety there. But make no mistake about it, the sciences themselves are in the same sort of danger that that they're in danger of the same process that swamped the humanities. Because I'm an alarmist, because I'm not an alarmist, I'm fundamentally an optimistic person.
person, believe it or not. And yeah, it was pretty amusing, eh? But, but I could see the writing on the wall. And so I thought, as an educator, it's my duty when I see the writing on the wall to say what I see and think. And I don't believe that anything that I've said in public in the last 18 months has been proved incorrect. And believe me, there's been plenty of people trying to prove it incorrect. So speaking of writing on the wall, up on the wall you have words that I think there are companies, there are individuals in this room that are proud of their uh, ability to have generated diverse thoughts in order to include other people, in order to make sure that uh, they have equal opportunities. There's no evidence whatsoever that diversifying your workplace as a consequence of increasing the number of groups that are included constitutes an improvement in diversity of thought. That's an absolute fallacy. There's no evidence for it at all. And that's not to say that attempts shouldn't be undertaken to remove structural barriers to, to everyone who needs a job, obviously, if you're a greedy capitalist, you know, one of the things you want to do is open yourself up to <laughs> exploiting the largest number of people possible, to say it most cynically. And so you're only working at cross purposes to yourself if you have foolish policies in place that discriminate against qualified people. That's certainly not the issue. There should be no discrimination whatsoever ever against qualified people. It does no one any good whatsoever. But to claim that you improve diversity of thought by including, improving diversity of group membership is to fall firmly into the postmodern trap that claims that the fundamental marker of human identity is the group. And that's simply incorrect. It's incorrect factually as well as morally. So, and you know, the problem, companies need to take this into account very, very carefully is they're, they're, they're manifesting their tolerance by playing this game. I'm telling you very straightforwardly that this is not a game that companies want to play because the people who are playing this game seriously are not the friends of companies. Put it that way, put it mildly. And, and these all sound like the, what, what would you call their, the badges of honor of the tolerant and, and compassionate. I don't buy that for a second. They're, they're, they're verbal weapons. They're the verbal weapons that are being used by a fifth column and corporate America is foolish enough to allow them into their, into their, what would you call them, allow them into their boardrooms. It's a very bad idea and they're going to pay for it, so. Well, this is, um, it continues to be very provocative in the things that you're saying, but maybe we could take a, a shift. You uh, spoke about things that you think are important and one of which is responsibility. So, um, I, I know from watching your YouTube videos that there are millions of people watching them, and you talk a lot about responsibilities. I think that some of those things, particularly industriousness and conscientiousness that is probably very deep in the farming ethos, um, can you talk a little bit about why, what you're talking about with responsibility and why you believe it's um, connecting so deeply with the people that watch your videos? Well, I would say that the discussion in the West for the last 60 years has been nonstop. The diet in the West, the intellectual diet in the West for the last 60 years has been a non-stop feast of rights. And there's a big problem with that. First of all, there's no difference between rights and responsibilities. Your <coughs> rights are my responsibilities and vice versa. That, that's, where, that's how rights exist, right? We each allow each other a space and we undertake the responsibilities necessary to, to make that space possible. So you just can't have endless conversation about rights without creating a conceptual vacuum. The other problem is, it is rights lend meaning and dignity to life. You all know that. What lends meaning and dignity to life? It's not impulsive pleasure. It's not living for the moment. It's not your damn rights. It's your willingness to lift up a responsibility <coughs> to take, to take uh, concerted action to make your life better at the same time that you make other people's lives better. You all know that as farmers. That's what you're doing. That's what makes the world work, to tend your garden properly and to make it say, nourish the world properly. We need to have a discussion about responsibility. And I see this particularly as something that's particularly germane for reasons I don't exactly understand to young men. And I think it's because no one has talked to them properly, at, at least at a, 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 like a profound philosophic or psychological level, about the fact that nobility in life is to be found by bearing up under the greatest responsibility that you can Imagine that you can manifest. That's what gives you dignity and worth. It's not happiness, it's not rights, all that shouting idiocy that we're being spoon-fed. It's appalling to me. And so when I think people know this deep in their 
They know this deep in their hearts, that this is a shallow game and that it's a dangerous game. And that there's nothing revolutionary about this in any sense. It's a return, unless it's radically, it's revolutionary, revolutionarily conservative, something like that. It's like, you, how can you have any respect for yourself without taking on some of the burdens of the world? You know, and you need respect for yourself because life is very difficult. Life is tragic and full of suffering. You need to have a means to justify your miserable existence. And you do that by bearing up nobly under the burden of life. And that's a much better alternative than turning to the blandishments of the far right and discovering your white identity and joining the bloody neo-Nazis or drifting off to the left where everything's about resentment and victimization and privilege and tearing down the damn system. It's sickening as far as I'm concerned. And it's time that it comes to a stop. Yeah. Dr. Peterson, as um, a man that doesn't have children yet, uh, I think a great deal about what it will be like to raise a child through you know, being little all the way up to getting to college. If you, as a professor, have watched maybe generations of kids come through your doors, what are the parents doing that are preparing your children to be ready for the tussle that is, or should be, university education right now? Well, don't shelter them. Don't encourage them to view themselves as victims. We know obviously life is difficult. Everyone's life is tragic. Everyone dies at the end. You know, there's no doubt that life is difficult. But to, 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 to decide as a consequence of that that the right stance to take in relationship to being in the world is to be a victim is not only pathetic and weak, but destructive and terrible. It leads to nothing but not first resentment and then a kind of, kind of, well, resentment is only the beginning, a kind of murderous hatred that resentment breeds. It's a terrible thing. What do you do with your children? Is you expose them incrementally to the things that they're afraid of, and you challenge them, and you make them strong so that they can deal with the inevitable snakes in the garden. Right? You don't shelter them and make them weak and tell them they're victims and confuse them about their identity and describe their entire culture as corrupt and turn them into hopeless nihilists by the time they're 18. That's not a good idea. And I know you all know that's not a good idea. There's, there's things to be done in the world that are worth doing. And that's what you tell your children. Get the hell out there, right? Get the hell out there. Plow some ground, plant some trees, feed some people, use your damn head, and quit whining about the substructure of existence. It's unfair, obviously. It's tragic, clearly. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna whine about that and hide in your basement and talk about how the world is oppressing you? Jesus, that's so pathetic. There's hardly, hardly words for it. So you know, you encourage your children. Human beings are very, very tough and resilient creatures. And despite the fact that we live under the ever-present shadow of death, we're capable of facing this whole life and bearing it no way. And that's what we need to do. Our whole culture is predicated on that principle. And that's actually why it's not corrupt before. Right? Our whole culture is predicated on the idea of the that's the West, the culture of the heroic individual who confronts chaos and transforms it into habitable order, the oldest story of mankind. We live it out properly, and that's how you raise your children, not to be safe. There's no safety in life. What are you, are you a fool? There's no safety in life. I mean, how many of you have been mangled by heavy machinery? You know, there's no safety in life. You train your children to be courageous and confident, not to be safe. And that's something that we need to remember, because that's how you make people safe. You make them confident, so that they can function in the world, so that people can't tyrannize them, not without a fight. So that when the inevitable flings and arrows of fortune make themselves manifest, that they're ready for them, and ready to like, take arms against their sea of trouble. Right? Strength and virtue, honesty, responsibility, all those are associated with a deep meaning in life, and it's, it's that deep meaning that stops people from becoming cynical, nihilistic, and destructive. We all know this. We need to remember it. We need to take not so much pride in it, but we should take humble gratitude for the fact that we already know this. Dr. Peterson, you mentioned about safety, and we've talked about some ideas that are 
I would say, countercultural, if not altogether um, pushed out of society. In fact, I can feel myself having that sense of, uh, of danger in talking about these words. And we're addressing in front of an audience of farmers who are every day out there cultivating the land, working very hard. Why should they take on this challenge when all around them, people will say, you shouldn't talk about those things. That's not allowed. You shouldn't be associated with those ideas. Put your head down. Well, you know, there are times in your life where you have the choice to engage in the conflict now or to wait and engage in it later when it's worse. Those are your options. There's, there's, no, there's no clear path to quietude and safety here. So and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe things aren't moving down this road, but I don't think so. I think they are. And, and it's certainly the case that this is already the situation in the universities. And so we might, this problem might as well be solved while it's still solvable. That's my estimation. And there's lots of times where you don't get to not engage in the conflict. You know, it's perfectly reasonable when people confront you with a conundrum to say, look, I'd rather not have the trouble that goes along with that. That's exactly what you should say most of the time because to walk away from a fight is usually the most intelligent thing to do. But if you know full well that walking away from one opponent means that three are going to show up at your doorstep the next day, then it's not very wise to walk away. And I would say, and I see this happening constantly, especially in the corporate world now, you know, the radical leftists go after the corporations for their hypothetical corruption. And I'm certainly not saying that corporations are without corruption because they're also made out of people. But they, they, they bend backwards immediately and take two steps backwards and the radicals take two steps forward and the situation is even worse in the next quarter. And so that's just gonna continue to happen. So it's, it's, far, it's, like, it's not like you have do nothing and safety on this hand and engage in the conflict foolishly on that, this hand. That's not the choices. It's like straighten this out now or wait. If you wait, you're gonna be sorry. So that's how it looks to me. And you know, I might not be correct. See, I've been talking about this sort of thing in Canada now to a scandalous degree, let's say, for really for about 18 months. And I've been called every name in the book, I think. Well, Hitler is pretty much as bad as it can get. So yeah. kind of talked out there. Um, luckily, the source wasn't very credible, to say the least. Um, I've got about 300 hours of videos online, something like that, that outlines why I think this way. And, well, as you pointed out, people seem to find it quite compelling. And it's because, as far as I can tell, I, I don't really have a stake in this in some sense, except that I can see that things are going in a direction that I don't think is good. And I'm saying that as straightforwardly and as deeply as I possibly can. I spent my whole entire academic career studying the atrocities of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, trying to understand how those things came about to understand how cultures could become that warped and bent and demented, and how the people within them, normal individuals, could commit the absolute atrocities that they all committed. And I think I understand that very well, un unfortunately well, you might say. And that's, that's, that all that research constitutes the bedrock, I would say, of the knowledge that's enabled me to see the writing on the wall, let's say. You can watch my videos if you're interested or not, if you're not and decide for yourself if I know what the hell I'm talking about. And like I said, perhaps I don't, but I'm afraid I do, so that's how it is. <laughs> so you bring up an interesting point, and it's one that I think the farmers themselves face in their own lives, which is the question of being wrong. And one thing I've heard you say several times on your lectures is there's only two people who are willing to tell you what they think of those that love you and those that hate you. And you should listen to those that hate you, the ones that deeply agree with you, because they may be the one that wants to hear just how wrong your ideas are. So how do you open yourself up? Because there are all of these waves. There's all sorts of um, uh, contention around you. How do you keep yourself strong to be able to go out and say things that you believe, but also open enough to let the people that hate I you hold up their hair. I don't think I'm pretty strong. I just think I'm afraid of the right things. That's not the same thing, right? No, I mean, <clears throat> turning away from, from one monster to face a smaller one doesn't really constitute bravery. It just constitutes wisdom. So 
And because what I see coming isn't good, then confronting what I see now doesn't seem great. It just seems crude. So there's that. Then with regards to listening to your enemy, well, I've done plenty of that. I mean, seriously. I, and then this is the literal truth. I would say there hasn't been a single day in the last 15 months where I haven't been embroiled in something deeply controversial. I mean, and I mean seriously controversial. And I'm getting that sense, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm constantly being assaulted, let's say, by accusations of all sorts, and I'm taking them very seriously. I talk with my family, who are very smart and wise and supportive, and I talk with my friends, and we go over what I'm saying with a fine-tuned comb, and I'm thinking and writing constantly to see if I'm on the right track, and listening to the criticism, because I want to get this right. And you know, so if someone throws 50 things at you and 49 of them are unwarranted, one of them might be true, it's worth figuring out which one of those is true, because maybe you can bloody well fix it, you don't have to walk blindly into a pit. You know, that's the advantage of listening to your critics. But I think I've done that. And, I mean, certainly not perfectly, but as well as I can do it. And so, but I don't, you know, and I'm also very critical of my own thinking. I'm always trying to pry it up with a crowbar one way or another to see if I've left something fundamental unaddressed. And well, like I said, you can, you can, you can look online and, and you can find that out for yourself and see what you think. And, I guess there's some other evidence for my credibility, if, if that evidence needs to be put forward. I did this series of biblical lectures last year. It was quite surreal, I would say. I rented a theater in Toronto, and uh, I did 13 lectures on Genesis. It's a book I really, well, it's a staggering book, speaking from a psychological perspective, which is what I was doing in the videos, because I'm not a theologian. But uh, the theater was packed every time. It was all young men, and millions of people have watched the lectures online. It's like, well, what the hell's up with that? You know, how do you get an audience full of young men to attend psychological lectures on Genesis? Are you going to present that as a business plan? It's like, good luck with that. You know, so there's something that I'm saying, and I don't think it's because I'm saying it. It's because like, I've been studying mythology and religious thinking and belief systems for a very long time and tried to get to the bottom of them as much as I possibly can. And I've been explaining what I've learned, and it's not the fact that I'm explaining it. It's the, it's the power of this, uh, these underlying stories that is, that's, carrying the, that's carrying the day. You know, our culture is Judeo-Christian in its fundamental origin. And, and of course, that, those, the ideas of Judeo-Christianity have been under radical assault for about 400 years, partly for good reason, partly because of the rise of science. And, transformed into reality. That's what we all do. And we have a we have an ultimate moral obligation to confront a possibility and to turn it into something as closely resembling heaven as we can, rather than doing everything we can to turn it into hell. And we did that in the We did that in the 20th century. We turned things into hell. And I don't think we should do it again. So, and I think that we're in great danger of walking down the same pathway. And I don't think we should do it. So I think that everybody should man up and bear their suffering properly and fix what they can fix around them and straighten out their lives and work for themselves and for others. Put them ship straight again to sail on properly into the future. Dr. Peterson, our time has run out. 
but I know yeah, that you would... <laughs> <laughs> Our, um, I know that you handed out flyers today for a book. Yes. One of the reasons I'm excited about your book is that unlike a video, I can take a book and I can highlight it and I can say, I agree with this or I disagree with that. Can you just say a few words about your book before we sign off? Yes, I should, or my publisher will sue me. Um, it's called 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. And it takes, I wrote some rules a while back for this website called Quora. I wrote about 40 of them. Some kid wrote in and asked what some good guidelines for living were. And so I wrote down these 40 rules. Um, and they were very popular on this website. Um, Tens of thousands of people read them and commented on them. So I turned 12 of them into a book. The book is a meditation on the sorts of things that I talked with you about today and an attempt to help, an attempt to lay, you could think about it as a, a self-help book in some sense. I mean, just that's one way of thinking about it, but I would say it's, it's deeper than most self-help books. I'm not trying to denigrate my competition. I mean, it's more of a warning about the difficulty of the book, I would say. But I'm trying to lay out, for example, what it means for people to be made in the image of God. Because part of what that means is that, see, at the beginning of time, God used the word to conjure order out of potential, conjure order out of chaos. That's the story of Genesis, the origin story. And human beings are made in that image. And what that means is that we have that spark of the divine in us that enables us to conjure up order out of chaos. And if we do that properly, honestly, that is primarily, if we do that honestly and with responsibility, then the order that we conjure up the possibility is good. This is what God says when he creates, he creates the world at the beginning of time. He uses truth to speak forward order and describes it as good. Well, the, the order that we can pull out of the chaos that surrounds us with the use of truth is good, and that's what we should aim for. And I'm trying in this book, at least in part, to explain what those ideas mean so that people can get a grip on them and understand, really understand what they mean so that they can be fortified in their necessary confrontation with the tyranny of the state and the chaos of, of, of nature. So, so you can take a look at that book if you're interested in Take some reading. It's a difficult <coughs> book, but I'm hoping that it will it was as will be as worthwhile to read as it was to write. That's the good. That's a good hope if you've written a book. <coughs> Is any good? So, well, twelve well, rules for life. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank the American Farm Bureau for entertaining a very provocative uh, and exciting talk, and uh, on behalf of. Um, the people in here, Dr. Peterson, I would like to thank you for the level of emotion and care with which you brought to this conversation. It shows how much you care, and uh, I would invite people to come up and speak with you afterwards for a few moments if you'll be available. Thanks, Matt. Thank much you. Appreciate it. Thank you.